Shall we bow our heads in a word of prayer? Father, again we come in the precious name of Jesus, asking for a new anointing from heaven and for divine illumination upon the word. Speak to our hearts once again, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So thankful for this beautiful voice that God has let us listen to through Michael. It seems like Michael, the gift in him, can put the majesty into a song that needs to be in it. I don't know how else to put it, but... <laughs> so we're just thankful for it. If you have your Bibles, I want us to turn to the book of Romans, the fifth chapter. And read several verses here. First of all, the 12th verse. Book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 12, and then jumping up to 17. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Uh, for all have sinned. Now it's the 17th verse. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. I think I'll just stop there. I want to emphasize the one. Then I want to read over in St. John's Gospel, the 17th chapter. The ninth, starting with the ninth verse, St. John's Gospel, chapter 17. Jesus said, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. Verse 20, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe in me through the word, that they all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they all may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. The Bible has in it many mysteries, the mystery of godliness, the mystery of iniquity, and I want to look to you to look this morning at one of God's great mysteries that I cannot explain. But I, all I can do is look at it and marvel and wonder at it. And that is this mystery of oneness. Now, as I read to you there in Romans, it says that by one man sin into the world. Now that to me is a great mystery. I don't know how that can possibly be. I don't know how one man can sin, and that from then on thousands and millions and billions of people, that that sin has been transferred into every human heart because God has dealt with the whole human race through one man, just one. And that no matter how much of a saint a person is, the children that would come from that saint will still have the nature of that one man. Now, I don't understand this oneness. I said I'm speaking to you about a great mystery. And then along the same line, we come, Jesus then comes into the world and dies for us, and that God can deal with the whole human race through one person. He deals with us through Jesus. Now, I don't understand these great mysteries. But God has dealt with his people through one person. You take, for instance, the tribe of Levi. When Levi sinned, God dealt with the whole tribe through that one man. Uh, they, they were all, all, the whole tribe 
they were cut out of Israel's inheritance, just this one man, and they all got cut out. I want you to, I'm trying to help you to see something this morning, the, the oneness of God. When Israel went into Canaan, they had to go in as a nation. Uh, not individuals, they had to go in a nation. For Abraham, you see, was called into, into Canaan, and he went there, and they could have, uh, if they would have stayed there, uh, they could have grown up and been multiplied millions of people, but they wouldn't have been a nation. And God wanted them as one, and so he sent them down into Egypt to develop them into a nation so he could deal with them as one. And therefore, when they came back into Canaan, they came in as one. Now, the church is the very same way. We can get saved as an individual, but there are things that God wants done in the world that he can only do as the church is one. Now, th this is a great mystery. You'd think he, he commanded uh, the people to go into all the world and preach the gospel, and you can go out witnessing and everything else, but the real work of God can only be done, the great work of God can only be done when there's oneness in the church. Now, I don't understand this. I'm just simply saying, here's the word of God, and as we look at it, we, we, and uh, you take, for instance, the day of Pentecost. It says they were all with one accord in one place, and I'm really thankful for that. Now, you ask me, how did they get in oneness? I don't know. I don't know how they came to oneness. Uh, there's lots of uh, speculation on it, but the Bible doesn't tell us. The only thing I know is that Jesus prayed for it, and as far as I can see, the greatest thing that came in the day of Pentecost was the answer to Jesus' prayer. Now, I don't know. I might be wrong. But uh, I know that they had to come to oneness before God could do the work that he wanted to do. He couldn't send them all out scattered preaching the gospel. They had to come to oneness to get done what he wanted done. And so the same thing is true of the church today. Uh, now... Uh, unity, Jesus prayed for, and why this is so important, I don't know that I can answer that. I know it's important, but Jesus said he prayed because he said that the world might believe. Now, notice the world, before they can believe, is going to come not from personal witnessing, but from the unity of the church. I'm, I'm looking at a great mystery here. The world is only going to believe from the oneness of the church, not from personal witnessing. Now, personal witnessing is good. I'm not cutting that out. And individuals can be saved. But that the world might believe can come when they become to oneness. Now, Israel, as I said, was a nation, and he dealt with them that way as oneness. Now, uh, as we look at this, he wanted to take them all into Israel together. And when they were in the wilderness, they fought battles together. In the New Testament, the church is one body. He deals with us, and in many things, he deals with us as an individual person. We are one. Now, I think it's uh, someone put it this way, that Paul did not say the church is like a body. He said the church is the body. It is the body, and God deals with all of our parts are necessary, but we still are definitely a part of each other, whether we like it or not. <laughs> we are part of each other, and there is a mystical body in which God deals with us as that body. Now, I want you to look at something that may help us a little bit in this. In the book of Exodus, the 17th chapter, I want to go back and read in book Exodus 17, starting with verse 8. This is where they were in the wilderness, and uh, they had a battle to fight. And the I'm more acquainted with this, but I want to read it anyway. It says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. 
And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat there on and Aaron and her stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi, where he said, Because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. That means that's still going on with us today. Now I want you to see something. Here, Israel and God dealt with them as a body, and they are meeting an enemy. And God, Moses said, now, uh, Joshua, you choose out men and go out and fight this battle, and tomorrow I'll go to the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. And the Bible shows us that when he lifted up his hand, Joshua down in the valley uh, conquered. There was a great, Israel was moving forward because of this prayer going on up in the mountain. Then Moses' hands got heavy, and when he put his hands down, Israel, Joshua, went backwards. And finally, Aaron and Hur came to the rescue and got on one side and one on the other and lifted his hands and held up steady, and finally the battle was won. Now I want to ask you a question. Who won that battle? Did Joshua win that battle? He was chosen of God. God's, he was the leader. Did he win that battle? I want to tell you something. They couldn't have won it without him. Well, what about the soldiers? Did they win it? Joshua couldn't have won that battle without them. And I want to tell you something. You couldn't have won that battle without them. I want you to stick with me. They, you couldn't have won that battle without every soldier down there. Well, what about Moses? He's up on the mountain praying and lifting his hands and they're moving down and forth, back and forth without it. Uh, did Moses win that battle? Well, I want to tell you something. They couldn't have won it without him. Well, what about Aaron and her? Come on now. Moses' hands grew heavy, and he, you couldn't have won without Moses, but his hands were heavy. He couldn't pray all the time, and his hands went down. So Aaron and Hur got on one side and one on the other, and how important were they? Well, I want to tell you something. You couldn't have won that battle without them. Are you, are you with me? I have something else I want you to see about Aaron and Hur. Uh, they certainly... <laughs> Anybody ought to be able to hold up a hand. I don't care. You probably say, well, I'm just not worth anything. I can't do anything. Well, I want to tell you something. It didn't take much intelligence to hold up hand, and it didn't take any special calling, nor special ability, nor gifts of the Spirit, nor any calling of any kind to just hold up a man's hand. That battle couldn't have been won without them. Are you sticking with me? It, and I want to tell you something else. It didn't take a revelation for them to hold up his hands. People sitting around waiting on a revelation. You may get left out. Now you read the story, brother. It says they, they were Aaron and her. They saw what was going on and without a revelation, brother, they pitched in and got over there and started helping out. And you couldn't have won the battle without them, but they got in there and did their part and never had a revelation to do it. Come on now, we can get bogged down. I, I prove a revelation, but we can get bogged down with revelations, and some things may never be done that you ought to do because you didn't get a revelation and saw it and didn't do it. How you like that? That all right? That ought to help for a little bit. Some things need to be done around the church. You don't need a revelation to do it. But God deals with us as a unit. And so here it is. They got over there. They put him on a rock. They, all of this they were doing without a revelation. They were doing because, and they were people. It certainly wasn't a showy job. It's amazing the people, the people want a showy job. If I could just get up front now and do something. 
lead the singing or, or preach or sing or do something. But these men were winning the battle by doing something that wasn't showing, and you couldn't have, you couldn't have won that battle without Aaron and her. So this is the way God deals with the church as a unit. Who wins the battle of the church? Does the preacher? Well, you certainly, he's needed. You can't get along without him. Does the choir do it? You certainly can't get along without them. Oh, what about it? every part of the church, whatever you think is needed? Every part is needed. And the Bible says that when the church, therefore, if everybody is functioning as they ought to function, and it's many of it are the people that think they can't do anything and aren't doing it, I want to tell you, the winning of the battle is, ne is necessary for them to do their part for them to win the battle. The Bible shows it in this. I think that's why he sent Aaron and her up there. See, God could have won the battle some other way, but he showed us some of the picture here in the oneness that uh, all of them. So who won the battle? Joshua won it. The soldiers won it. Moses won it. And Aaron and her won it. And it took all of them together to win it. Now, I want to tell you, if any one of them would have dropped out, the battle would have been lost. Because God dealt with Israel as a unit. He deals with this church as a unit. And you can say, well, it doesn't make any difference what I do. It makes a lot of difference what you do. And what you don't do may be the reason for the church losing a battle. Because you think you're not important. I would say, I don't understand this great mystery. I don't know why God should deal with us as a unit because of everyone having to fill their place and do what they're supposed to do. And if that's trying to help us see that everybody in this church is important, I don't care who they are. And God will deal with this church. And therefore, he said that the world may believe. He said, Lord, I pray, they, Jesus prayed the prayer that, that they come to oneness, that the world may believe. And when he can get a church that will do that, everybody doing their little part of just nothing but holding up hands, then the world will begin to believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God because you've got some Aaron and hers over here doing something that isn't showy at all. And nobody notices it. And they didn't take a revelation to do it, but they did it. And he said, the world is going to believe. Now, I don't understand that mystery, but it's true just the same. Yes. It's a true. So the battle couldn't have been won without any one of these. You take any one of them away and the battle would have been lost. And Paul gives us this beautiful revelation in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, where it says the body is one but many members. And the members, it says, which seem to be, seem to be more feeble are necessary. How do you like the wording of the Word of God? Do you think you're one of the feeble ones in the church? I'm not asking you to raise your hand, but if you did, I wouldn't be surprised what there'd be a number of hands go up. What's that? God's Word says your nest is more. I, did it say more? Where does that say? Yeah, feeble are, are, are more. I believe the word more is in there. Are more necessary. Now, if that doesn't encourage your heart, you're in bad condition. If you can't get encouragement out of that, brother, the members which seem to be more feeble, actually they're, they, they think they're feeble, but they're more necessary. And the members that we think are less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. Dear me, that puts the people up front down pretty much at the bottom, and the people that aren't up here, it puts them, looks like, up on the top. Why, why does anybody want to be up front if the more honor goes to somebody that seems to be at the bottom? Isn't God wonderful? I love the way God does things. And it says, God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. I love the Lord. <laughs> that no schism in the body but would have care one for another. That's why the body should be such a unit that we should have such love and care for one another and interested in one another because we're all of the same body. So the body, uh, as I said, is not, like somebody said, is not, uh, the church is not like 
a body, but the church is the body of Christ. Jesus, the head, we are the body, and that absolutely every person in it is important, and for the world to believe, we're all going to have to fill our place if it's nothing more than to hold up hands and do what it is. For the battle cannot be won unless the whole church wins the battle.